Hello and welcome to a new episode of Bite Size Book History. I'm your host, Allie Alvis. I am a rare book cataloger at antiquarian book dealer Type Punch Matrix, which is where I am now. But what exactly is an antiquarian book dealer? And how are they different from a secondhand bookseller? And what do either of these people even do? As with many things in the rare book world, there are lots of definitions for these two concepts, none of which most people agree on. Usage varies widely. Even Carter's ABC for Book Collectors defines antiquarian bookseller by the variety inherent in the trade, rather than providing an actual definition. In his Dictionary of the Book, Sidney Berger also dodges the question somewhat. Although he notes that books in antiquarian bookshops tend to be more quote unquote valuable than those in secondhand or used bookstores. The term antiquarian is kind of the linchpin here. Antiquarian comes from the Latin word antiquarius, meaning pertaining to ancient times. Roman writers such as Pliny the Elder were particularly interested in exploring the monuments of history searching for the origins of various aspects of life. For centuries, an antiquarian was a someone, not a something. An antiquarian was interested in this search for origins and curiosities across various fields, focusing on historical objects, the stuff, rather than the narrative. All this is to say that the term antiquarian book is basically shorthand for old and interesting book. Again, though, variety is an important part of this definition. Interesting can mean very different things to different people. And just because something is old doesn't make it rare. The term rare has its own ins and outs of definition disagreement, but in general, it is more inclusive than the term antiquarian. It's a term that can be used to describe modern productions and artists' books in the same way that it describes the Bay Psalm book. An inscribed first edition of Stephen King's Carrie is not an antiquarian book, but it is a rare book. This is part of the reason why we have rare book libraries and special collections libraries, rather than antiquarian libraries. Type Punch Matrix describes itself as a rare book firm, which is a conscious choice. It offers a bit more clarity on the kind of work that we do and the kind of books that we have. Bookseller Don Lindgren of Rabelais Rare Books describes antiquarian as more of an approach than any single object. It's a continuation of the tradition of antiquarian as individual, and a way to focus on books as unique historical objects in their own right. While some booksellers specialize in areas like science or Americana, Something that I really like about Type Punch Matrix is the variety that we have. I've been lucky enough to catalog picture books that I loved as a kid that sell for like 35 bucks here, but I've also been able to catalog incredible 17th century works that push five figures. When you really sit down to think about it, all this variety is really what makes the book trade what it is. Every book buyer has different preferences, and part of being a bookseller is figuring that out. I've only been a bookseller for a little over a year now, but my bosses here at Type Punch Matrix, Rebecca Romney and Brian Cassidy, have a combined total of 30 years of bookselling experience. So let's talk to them about their experiences in the trade and what they can tell us about the wonders of book collecting and bookness in general. Thank you for joining me today uh, here at work, where we all work. <laughs> Not too much of a commute for you. So this is Rebecca Romney and Brian Cassidy, uh, the two owners and uh, directors of Type Punch Matrix. So Rebecca, how did you get into book selling? So I got into book selling entirely by accident. I did not know it was a thing before I had first seen that job that uh, actually was the one I applied for and got it. It was one of those moments where I actually thought I shouldn't even apply to this because I'm not qualified to be a rare book dealer, but it turned out I had all the qualifications they were seeking. And because of that, I did get the job. And as with most people who are in the rare book trade, I learned 
on the job like an apprenticeship. That is the old school way of learning how to do this and it is still the best way to learn how to do it because you have someone who can kind of guide you through the process. Um, and for me, I was very, very lucky to have people around who had a lot of experience who could kind of point out things to me before I really went off the rails and things like that. And so for me, it was really being in the right place at the right time with the right background and then jumping on the opportunity when it appeared. So I know I am lucky. I am happy and grateful every day for the, the situation that sort of found me. And it really was the right fit for me in the end because what I had planned to do was really not going to be a good idea for me, so. <laughs> I'm glad it all worked out. Um, Brian, how did you get into the rare book trade? I've told this story before as well, but I, I like to joke I, I ended up a rare book dealer because I failed as a poet. <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, I spent much of my 20s, I, I got an MFA, and I spent much of my 20s um, teaching um, mostly part-time and adjunct positions um, and to make ends meet um, since those didn't pay well or part-time I, I spent a lot of time working in bookstores um, so I worked in a bookstore when I was uh, getting my graduate degree um, and then I worked in a series of bookstores um, throughout my 20s and th this was the the mid to late 90s and eBay was just starting to get rolling and uh, one of the things about working, I was working mainly in new and independent bookstores, and one of the things about new and independent shops is um, you, you end up with a lot of free books. You end up with a lot of advanced readers' copies and proofs, and um, I worked at a couple of bookstores that had great um, reading series. I ended up with signed books, um, and I sort of uh, slowly started um, flipping some of these on eBay in the early days, um, and then uh, it, it just really just sort of grew from there. I kind of became increasingly aware that um, rare books was a thing you could do, um, and uh, eventually um, in 2004 I started my own business and started listing on Abe and elsewhere, and here, here we are. <laughs> 10,000 10, books later. Yeah. <laughs> we, we joke that we really came from opposite ends of the trade where, you know, Brian started at a place where he had to earn his way, work his way up to what uh, he became with his business. And I received a sort of top-down training and had to learn totally different skills much later because when you start an established company, there are certain things you kind of take for granted mm -hmm. that I had to learn from scratch when I left that company. And so we joke that we each have a very different skill set for that reason that's kind of complementary. And between us, we each know half of the trade. <laughs> it's just a different half for each of us. Right. Yeah. So what makes a book rare? And I've talked a little bit about antiquarian versus rare versus secondhand. And Brian, you mentioned secondhand. What, what exactly makes a rare book? Well, uh, there's kind of two ways you can think about that. There's, you can think of a rare book in its absolute literal term. Um, a book can be rare objectively, um, which is to say it is, uh, there are very few copies and it is very difficult to find. Um, and we do certainly use the term rare in that sense in, in our business. But generally when people are talking about rare, what they really mean is um, a book that is collectible for, for one reason or another. Um, so a book that's signed or a book that's a first edition, um, it's, it's a book that, that um, uh, combines some element of, of the history of the object itself with some measure of desirability. Um, so uh, those two things together are generally what we mean when we say rare. Um, at least when we use the term rare books. I like to perhaps oversimplify it into an equation. For me, it's very much a supply and demand equation like any marketplace, but the supply side is what we call scarcity. You know, if there aren't that many copies. And then the demand is the collectability side. And so something that is very scarce and in high demand is a rare book. Um, and so that again is very, very simple. And the idea is for any individual book, you kind of have to weigh the supply and demand. How much do people want it? How many copies survive? In what condition? Whether it's signed? And you play this sort of game. It's, it's really a sort of a balancing of all those details for any individual book in front of you. And that's why you can have one book price it one way and you might have another copy of the same book and price it completely differently by literally tens of thousands of dollars in some cases. Mm -hmm. And so it's always just a balance of that equation. And that's why we tend to simplify things and just call it rare books because that's meant to overall encompass the world of this scarcity, demand, and an antiquarian interest, an antiquarian in terms of thinking about these things as historical objects. 
another just quick quick way of thinking about it since you mentioned secondhand is you know sort of what separates a secondhand book dealer from a rare book dealer and and there's a lot of overlap between those and a lot of gray area in in, in between there um, so it's it's not a it's not a hard and fast distinction um, but one useful way I find of thinking about it is that we, we tend to send, sell the object and secondhand book dealers are still tending to send sell the text mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's another way to think about it. It also touches on, you know, the idea of value versus scarcity, like you mentioned, where something like a little chapbook from the 19th century might be really, really scarce, but it's not technically worth that much. Yeah, I mean, you can have, you can have, the example that I always give is, you know, you can have someone's self-published memoir that is objectively rare. There are no copies on the market, um, perhaps only 15 or 20 were printed for the family. Um, so it is an objectively quote unquote rare book, but there is practically no demand for it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, in, 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 in that case, is it a rare book even though it's objectively rare? Not really. Well, on the other hand, there are books that are um, not rare at all. They're incredibly common, but they're in really high demand. And so, I mean, one example of this is Toni Morrison's Beloved, mm -hmm. which is a book that is actually not that expensive on the collectible marketplace relative to a lot of other books, and especially for its importance. But it's just that there were so many copies printed mm -hmm. that it's really, really easy to find a first edition. So, you know, it, you look at it and you often think, like, how can this only be, you know, $800 for a signed edition or whatever it is? And because in comparison, you think, Toni Morrison, Nobel Prize winner, beloved. And you think it should be way, way, way more. But even though, you know, I feel that way, I can't just throw a big price on it because I think that the rest of the marketplace is right there and there are so many copies that the supply side you know is undeniable and you have to incorporate that into your thoughts. Yeah so very much the selling side of book selling. We've talked a little bit about the the logistics of that and the practicalities um, but how exactly do you sell a rare book? Well first you have to find them. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, 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 I say that kind of as a joke, but I really mean it. You know, a lot of people, I think, when they think about a company like ours where sales really is what drives keeping us in biz business, we're in a weird position because we cannot create our product. We cannot manufacture it. We literally have to find it. So a huge part of our efforts every single week are just in finding the material in the first place. And then once we have obtained it, we have to catalog it properly, essentially explain what it is. And that sometimes is very straightforward. Sometimes it can take weeks and months or even years to identify something. It really goes across the spectrum. And only after we have properly cataloged and described it do we even put it up for sale at all. So there's a lot of behind the scenes labor that happens before you see something, say, appear on our website. And it's not just describe it properly, but also to part of that describing is telling you why you should care about it, um, why it's important, why it's significant, um, uh, why it is, in other words, pitch it to the most likely buyer or buyers or markets. Um, and so once it's cataloged, it goes on our website, it goes online, we issue print catalogs that we mail to our mailing list. We also have a, um, <clears throat> an electronic mailing list uh, that we issue periodic um, e-lists to. We go to book fairs, um, we have established clients and customers that we will directly offer material to that we know they're potentially interested in or explicitly looking for. Um, so there's a number of different avenues, um, most of them actually fairly active in terms of our own involvement on them. I think the perception is often in this business that we sort of throw the books online and people buy them online and it's a very passive model. Um, and, and that is certainly true for some booksellers, but it is not true for us. I love the interaction part. I mean, one of the reasons that I have felt that rare book selling was the right fit for me is because I love hearing people get really passionate about whatever it is they're into. Like, I don't even have to be into it at all, you know? It doesn't have to be my interest, but if I see someone get really excited, that is what pleases me. And so for me, a lot of the selling that I do and a lot of the ways that we try to approach book selling, even online when you're dealing with that sort of extra layer where it's not necessarily person to person, is to focus on the passion and the joy in this. That is fundamentally why we do it, why we love it, why I love it, why I love working with collectors. And even people who say they aren't collectors or don't think they're collectors, but they just love this random thing and they need someone to talk to about it, like, I am here for you. 
Yeah, speaking of collecting, I mean, a lot of people think that to buy a book from an antiquarian book dealer or a rare book dealer, you have to be a collector. And, you know, I have some books, but I don't know if I'm a collector per se. So uh, can I still buy books from you? I mean, I know I do. But <laughs> for those of you out there who think that they might not be collectors, uh, let Brian and Rebecca tell you about how it's a little easier than you might think. Collectible and rare does not translate to expensive. Um, we have 15, 20, $25 books, lots of them, in fact. Um, it's, it's really about, um, as I said before, it's really kind of about why you're buying it. Um, you know, so if the object, the historical object and its history and um, uh, the, the, the bibliography, the story of the book um, is part of why you're buying it, um, then you're a collector no matter what price point you're buying it at. Um, you can actually put together a collection of quote unquote used books that would actually be very interesting. Um, you know, I've, I've known collectors who put together um, huge collections of one particular title, you know, 50 editions of On the Road or 100 editions of Grapes of Wrath. Um, and uh, l many of those collections are comprised of books that outside of that context really would be considered a used book, you know, a, normal, a regular paperback. Um, so uh, uh, if, if, if you are buying books and keeping them and um, enjoying and appreciating them for their objectness, um, then you are, you are a book collector. Yeah, exactly. I think that there is an idea about what a book collector is, and it tends to be the sort of headline type of book collector. It's a lot of money. It's, you know, all fancy authors. It's things that maybe you're not interested in at all. And I don't think that that is actually relevant to what most people do as collectors. Um, speaking for myself, I have a collection of gothic romances from the 1960s and 70s, all published by a paperback publisher, Ace. And these are, you know, awful paperback productions. And I mean awful in terms of, you know, the, the paper is totally like acid toned at this point, and it's really hard to find them not falling apart. And one of the rules for that collection of mine that I love is I don't spend more than $10 a book on those. And that's, you know, an arbitrary rule that I kind of made for myself, but I could because this is a category where I can do that. So it's just a question of thinking about approaches that work for your circumstances. If you, you know, don't live in a place where there are a lot of secondhand bookshops to browse, you can still find a lot online. There are even great booksellers, you know, on Instagram, and you don't even have to go to like ABE or places like that. There are so many different places where you can look. So you don't have to be in a bookish city anymore. You don't have to have a lot of money. You can even create found collections, material that you don't even have to purchase. Um, there are so many different ways to approach it. And if you're looking for ideas, the Honey and Wax Book Collecting Prize, which um, I co-founded with Heather O'Donnell of the Honey and Wax Booksellers. This was, it's, we're in our f sixth year now. So that is a book collecting prize for women in the U.S. under 30 years old. And the thing that's amazing about these collections, the winners have such creative approaches. In some cases, they have award-winning collections that fit into a shoebox, you know, or they're things that truly they didn't even spend any money on. They got them entirely in trade. So there are so many different ways to collect. And the question is, what makes you excited? What do you want to explore? And you can take that exploration and like make it 3D in this sort of treasure hunt of book collecting. Mm. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that. Um, if you've watched my bookshelf tour about that really awful Bible that I bought a while back, uh, the one that has like hair and fingernails and terrible things in the gutters, uh, you know, that I collect yucky books. And that's as valid as a collecting concern as uh, anything else. I, I at least think so. Um, well, You're right. <laughs> I, I agree. We unfortunately don't have many around here, fortunately, unfortunately. Uh, I think that's part of being a bookseller is keeping stuff on hand that isn't actively falling apart. Well, part, part of being a bookseller is um, what you say no to. Um, part, part, part of what we do is, part of the service that we provide is a certain amount of filtering um, of saying, you know, th this is a book um, in collectible condition and, um, you know, we, we, we say no to way more books that we're offered than we buy. Um, I, I mean, I think probably something, you know, five or ten to one is probably what the ratio looks like. Um, and most often we're saying no to a book, not because of the book itself, but because of the condition. Um, uh, we, you know, we, we, it's really important to us that we only bring in books 
um, that are in collectible condition and that we can really feel good about offering. Because um, so many people, when they collect, the, the concern is, you know, they become a caretaker for this book, you know, and they're worried about, you know, is this something that I feel like I can care for? And so that's a big part of it. We're thinking sort of in terms of, of, of the longer term or book world, you know, and what we can practically achieve as sort of private collectors taking care of things. Yeah. That's a really nice note to end on, the idea of stewardship of books and booksellers are just another sort of point on the book's path to wherever it ends up going. Uh, some of these books have very, very long lives um, and I know it makes me happy to be part of that history uh, when we get to handle it as booksellers. We're all part of this ecosystem that's much larger than us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of nice to belong. Um, well, thank you, Brian and Rebecca, for speaking with me today. Um, you can visit the Type Punch Matrix website uh, for more information. I will drop that in the description below. Um, so I'll let you get back to work. <laughs> thank you for having us. Thank you. That does it for this episode of Bite Sized Book History. If you enjoyed this format, look forward to future videos about rare book jobs coming in the future. And make sure to like and subscribe to stay in the bibliographic loop. I will see you next time. And remember, don't bite your books. Mm -hmm.